five heavy light tower on my two five left back line. Number two following Tempting Heavy Airbus three a mile final. Okay, number two. What's going on guys, Flyby Simulations here and welcome to the third video in the full flight portion of this aircraft's dissected series, where we delve into every single switch, knob and display in the flight deck of the Zebo Mod Boeing 737-800. In the previous episode, we looked at how to program the control display units or CDUs in the flight deck where we saw how to input various navigation and performance related factors into the flight management computer and prepare the aircraft for the flight. In this episode, we're going to be conducting the pre-flight procedure, where we use various flows to be able to check the position of every switch in the flight deck and prepare the aircraft for engine start, taxi, and eventually takeoff. So without further ado, let's jump into the flight deck. Alright ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the flight deck of the Boeing 737-800. So, as mentioned before, in this video we're going to be taking a look at the position of all of these switches and verify that their positions are indeed correct. What I didn't mention before is that we're going to be speeding through these switches one by one, without too much explanation as to what that switch or system does. That being said, if you do want to see what each and every single system, knob and button does in the aircraft, Check out the first 6 episodes of this series, where we do just that. So let's get started with the pre-flight procedure from the forward overhead panel. Alright, so starting at the top left, we have the flight control panel, where we're going to make sure that both the flight control switches, both the spoiler switches, and the alternate flaps master switch are all guarded. Additionally, we also want to make sure that only the two low pressure lights over here and this yaw damper light are illuminated. Speaking of the yaw damper, we're going to come down to its corresponding switch and turn it to the on position. Wait for one second and make sure that the light above it extinguishes, confirming proper operation of the yaw damper system. Coming down to the navigation panel, we just want to make sure that everything is set, so make sure that the VHF navigation, the IRS and the FMC switches are all in their normal positions. Coming below to the display selector, also make sure that the source is set to the auto position and the control panel is set to the normal position. So in essence, no need to do anything on these two panels other than verifying the correct position of the knobs and switches. Coming further underneath, we have the fuel panel, where starting from the top, we're going to make sure that both the engine and spar valves on either side are dimly lit and the fuel temperature gauge needle is between negative 45 degrees Celsius and positive 49 degrees Celsius. Coming underneath, make sure that both the filter bypass lights on either side are extinguished and that the crossfeed valve open light is also extinguished. Go ahead and verify that the position of the crossfeed valve switch is also broken, as you can see on screen right now, so as to suggest that the physical crossfeed valve is indeed closed. Finally, coming underneath, make sure that all of the fuel pumps are in their off position and the low oil pressure light above the wing tank pumps are illuminated and the ones on top of the center tank pumps are not. The reason these lights are not illuminated is because we're not carrying any fuel in these center tanks for our flight from San Francisco to LA. Next up, we're going to go all the way to the top of the next column on the forward overhead panel and monitor a few electrical parameters of the flight. So starting off, make sure that these three lights are extinguished. Coming down to this DC knob over here, switch it to battery and make sure that the current draw is 0 amps. As for the knob on the right, switch it to ground power to see the voltage being provided by the GPU for the electrical tasks on board the aircraft at the moment. Finally, make sure that the cabin utility and the in-flight entertainment system switches are both set to on. Coming further below to the standby power panel, we're going to make sure that the standby power switch guard is closed and the corresponding light is not illuminated. We also want to make sure that the two generator drive disconnect guards are closed and the drive lights above them are indeed illuminated. Coming below to the bus transfer and electrical source selector panel, simply make sure that the two gen off bus lights are illuminated and that the bus transfer switch is guarded and closed. Next up on the procedure checklist, we need to make sure that the overheat, fire and protection panel is set. Now we won't really be doing this in this episode as we already covered it and performed an exhaustive list of fire tests in episode 8 of this series, so go check that out if you haven't seen it yet. So next up, 
we're going to be starting the all-important APU, or auxiliary power unit within the aircraft, to make ourselves self-sustainable electrically and to get some bleed air within the aircraft to operate the air conditioning systems. So, simply come down to this APU switch and flick it to this start position and release it. It should automatically jump back to the on position, and this low pressure light above should come on. Additionally, you will also see the APU EGT, or exhaust gas temperature reading, increasing on this analog gauge over here. Now note that starting the APU takes around 2 or 3 minutes, so I'll see you guys when the APU is up and running. Alright ladies and gentlemen, so as you can see, the APU is up and running and is ready to supply electrical power to the aircraft. This is represented by the illumination of this APU Gen Off bus lights in the middle. So to individually power both sides of the aircraft, simply flick both these left and right switches down to the on position like so. As you saw, that also extinguishes the APU Gen Off bus lights, confirming that we're currently using the APU as our primary electrical power source. To confirm that we're getting enough power to be used from the APU, simply go back to the AC and DC power monitoring panel and switch this AC knob to APU Gen. As you can see from the CPS frequency indications as well as the AC amps and volts, we're clearly drawing power from the APU and it is indeed running successfully. Alright, next up on this middle column, we're going to go ahead and flick this emergency exit light switch guard down which automatically places the switch in the arm position. This means that the emergency exit lights will automatically come on in the passenger cabin in the event of an emergency. Coming underneath, we're going to switch the seat belt sign to the on position. Note that you must only do this after fueling has been completed in the aircraft. So since we fueled up our aircraft in the previous episode, we can go ahead and turn on the seatbelt signs so that the passengers entering the cabin immediately know what's expected of them from a safety standpoint. Finally, on this column, again make sure that the windscreen wipers are set to park mode and aren't set to any of the on modes by mistake. Alright, with the middle column taken care of, let's come to this external instrument heating panel and make sure that the overheat and on lights above the window heat switches are extinguished. Then, we want to make sure that all of the amber lights next to the probe heat switches are indeed illuminated. For the final test on this panel, flick this test switch up to see whether the overheat lights are working, and then flick the switch down to make sure that the on lights are working as intended as well. With that all done, Go ahead and flick all of the four window heat lights to the on position and note that the green on lights above them do indeed come on. Coming down to the icing panel, make sure that none of the lights are illuminated and that both the wing and engine anti-ice switches are turned to the off position. Finally, coming down to the hydraulic panel, make sure that the low pressure lights above all the switches are illuminated and that the engine hydraulic pumps are turned on and the electrical hydraulic pumps are turned off. Additionally, also make sure that the low pressure lights above all the switches are indeed illuminated, but the overheat lights above the electrical hydraulic switches are extinguished, which they are in this case. Alright, with that done, we're going to skip the cockpit voice recorder and the pressure monitoring panel underneath and move straight to the final column on the right of the forward overhead panel. So, here we have the internal air temperature control panel where the only thing we're going to do is to turn on this trim air switch. Again, if you need a detailed understanding of what the trim air system does in conjunction with all of the other primary subsystems within the aircraft, I highly recommend you to check out all of the previous episodes of this series. Anyways, once that's done, we're going to come down to this main air conditioning panel and manipulate a few switches. So starting from the top, we're going to make sure that the left and right recirculation fans are set to the auto position. Coming down to the packs, we're going to move both of them to the auto position as well, like so. While on the ground, we're also going to leave the isolation valve switch in the middle to the open position, which is the downmost position as you can see on screen here. Finally, coming all the way down to this trio of bleed air switches, make sure that the engine bleeds are indeed on, and then switch the APU bleed switch down to the on position as well. 
What this does is to allow the bleed air produced by the APU we just started to enter the pack system and the mix manifold system to be conditioned using the trim air to eventually be introduced into the cabin as temperature controlled air for breathing and comfort. So that brings us to this last panel on this rightmost column on the forward overhead panel, which is this pressurization panel. So again, starting from the top, we're going to dial in our cruising altitude for today's flight in this flight altitude display, which is 35,000 feet in this case. Next up in the landing altitude display, we're actually going to go ahead and dial in the altitude of our departure airport as we might be required to circle around and land back at San Francisco in case of an emergency. So as seen on airport charts, that altitude is around 13 feet and the display itself only changes in increments of 50. So we can leave the display to zero in this case. While on this panel, also make sure that the pressurization valve switch is in the middle position and the system itself is switched to the auto position. Coming down to this external lights and engine master strip, from left to right, make sure that all landing lights are off and the runway turn off and taxi lights are off as well. In the middle, make sure that both the engine start switches are set to the middle auto position and that the engine igniter switch is either set to left or right. Make sure it's not in the both position by any chance. Coming to the right, if you're flying at night or during poor visibility conditions, make sure to turn on the logo light. Moving right, make sure that the position light is in the steady position, as we set it at the start of the previous episode. Finally, make sure that the anti-collision light, the wing light, and the wheel well lights are all off. So, with all of those steps completed, we have now finished configuring the overhead panel. At this time, pilots would normally contact the clearance delivery controller at the airport and request for their departure clearance. Additionally, they will also note down the ATIS information, which we covered in detail in the previous episode of this series, so go check that out if you haven't already. So next up, we're going to be taking a look at the forward panels to prep the aircraft for eventually starting the engines. So, starting off, we're going to head into this mode control panel and turn on both the flight director switches. So since we're flying from the left side today, we're going to turn on the left flight director first and then the right one. This is because of the slave and master concept, however you can learn more about that in episode 5 of this series. Next up, we're going to this EFIS panel and setting some important information here. So as you can see on the procedure checklist, we're going to go ahead and enter the minimums for the departure aerodrome. So the minimums for our departure runway, 28 right, as you can see, is 213 feet radio and 200 feet in barrow. So simply go ahead and set the back knob here to the radio mode and use the front knob to set 213 feet on the PFD, like so. Next up, let's come to this knob on the right here and set the QNH or altimeter setting to 290.90, which is the current altimeter setting based on the ACARS data we received in the previous episode. Once both of these are done, do the same thing on the first officer's display and the standby display as well, but doing it for the captain is enough if you're flying from this seat. Next up, we're going to set a few other miscellaneous instruments on the forward panels. So starting off with the oxygen masks, simply go ahead and press this test switch to verify the flow of oxygen within the pilot's masks. Next up, let's make sure that the captain's digital clock shows the current local time and not the Zulu time, which is pretty easy to do using this button to cycle between the local and Zulu time as well as the current date. Next up, we're going to make sure that the display select switches are both set to the normal position so as to show the PFD on the outboard display unit, the ND on the inboard display unit, and other normal display configurations. Moving to the right, we're going to flick the disengage light test up to test system 1 and down to test system 2. And make sure that all of the lights are indeed illuminating. Finally, here we're also going to make sure that the flight instruments are checked, so make sure you don't have any yellow flags suggesting caution indications, Make sure that the FMA or flight mode enunciator on, th on top of the PFD is blank and also make sure that the main autopilot status mode reads FD or flight directors, thereby showing that the flight directors are indeed on. 
Of course, pilots would test all of the aforementioned systems individually on either side, but in the interest of time, we're only testing one side. Alright, next up, we're going to head over to the first officer's side and make sure that the ground proximity warning system has all of the guards closed on it and the inoperative light is extinguished. You may also perform the full exhaustive GPWS test if you please, but since we already saw that in episode 3 of this series, I won't be performing it again in this video. Coming back up, we're again going to make sure that the landing gear is set to the down position and that the three green lights are illuminated to signify that the undercarriage is down and locked. Coming to the left, we're going to turn the auto brake system to the RTO or rejected takeoff mode to be able to apply maximum brakes to come to a stop in case of an emergency during the takeoff roll. More information on that in episode 6 of this series. We're then going to verify that the anti-skid inoperative light is extinguished and that the engine display control panel is set. So make sure that the N1 setting is auto, the V speed setting is also auto, and the fuel flow switch is set to this middle rate position. Next up, go over to this MFD panel and press this engine button once to get an exhaustive list of engine indications on the LDU or lower display unit, which you can then verify. Alright, so the last set of tasks for the first officer in the pre-flight procedure require us to come back to the central pedestal we looked at in episode 2 of this series. So, to start off, we're going to go ahead and press this test button on the cargo fire panel to make sure that the appropriate lights and alarms are working as intended, like so. Next up, we're going to make sure that the radio tuning panel is set. So, if you're flying with ATC, you would make sure that you have the appropriate ground or tower frequency dialed into the standby radios over here. However, since we're not flying with any ATC, we're only going to be configuring the nav radios over here. So we're going to enter the ILS frequency for runway 28 right at San Francisco into these displays, which, as you can see on the airport charts, is 111.7. The reason for this is again for redundancy, in case we have some sort of emergency right after takeoff that requires us to perform a traffic pattern around the airport and return back to the runway. Finally, we're going to come down to this transponder panel and make sure that the squawk code is entered as required and that the appropriate TCAS system is also set. For now, we're going to leave the squawk code to 2000 and the TCAS system to stand by. Alright, so next up in the procedure checklist, we have the pre-flight procedure for the captain. So in real life, the captain and the first officer both set their side of the flight deck individually. However, we simmers don't have the luxury of having a co-pilot and must do everything ourselves. So a lot of the items on the captain's pre-flight procedure are similar to the first officers that we've just completed, so I'll be ignoring them in the interest of time and skipping straight to the new items that need to be checked. So, starting off, we make sure that the nose wheel steering switch guard is closed. Next, we're going to come to these status indications and make sure that the stabilizer out of trim light is indeed extinguished. Coming further right, make sure that the standby instruments are set. So make sure that the artificial horizon has the correct altimeter setting in place, in this case 29.90 inches of mercury as mentioned before. Also, check the standby RMI or radio magnetic indication and make sure that the two needles are set to VOR or ADF modes as needed. Next up, we're going to come back to this throttle quadrant and make sure that the speed brake lever is pushed down all the way to the down detent. Make sure that the reverse thrust levers behind the main thrust levers are all the way down and are disengaged. And speaking of the main thrust levers, make sure that they are also pulled all the way back to the idle position and that they are closed. Finally, on this throttle quadrant, make sure that the flap lever is set to 0 degrees and check to make sure that the analog gauge on the forward panel agrees with that flap position, which it does in this case as it reads up. Once that's all done, we're going to come back behind the throttle quadrant and check a couple of things. Starting with the parking brake, so make sure that it is set. Next up, make sure that both the engine start levers are in their appropriate cutoff positions. Finally, make sure that both the stabilizer trim cutout switches are set to the normal position, and that the metal guards in front of them are indeed in place to prevent them from accidentally moving to the cutout position. 
And that's that for the captain's pre-flight procedure. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of this aircraft's dissected episode, covering both the captain's and the first officer's pre-flight procedures. If you've made it this far, congratulations. You now have a sound understanding of how to appropriately follow flows in the 737-800 flight deck to monitor the various correct positions of knobs and switches on the forward panels. Additionally, you also know how to perform various tests across the flight deck and prepare the aircraft for engine start. That being said, the next episode in this series will finally have us push back from the gate and start the engines to get ready for taxi. Now, I must also mention that all of the documentation and websites I used to research for this video are linked down below in the description, including a written text version of this entire video if you prefer to read those and understand more about this aircraft. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to perform a full stop landing at the like button and the subscribe button, and press the bell icon for future notifications from this channel. Also, be sure to fly by the comment section and let me know if there's any questions you'd like me to answer for you. As usual, thanks for flying by.